Alright, everybody got their popcorn? Everybody ready to roll? Okay. Alright. Uh, just by way of introduction, I'm uh, Dr. Thomas Brzezinski, um, Associate Professor of Political Science here at St. Thomas. Um, I've been here for, uh, let's see, going on um, 16 years now, and um, I'm also head of the BAJD program. I see some of you out there, and I also teach over at the law school uh, on occasion. And um, today I'm here to talk about um, the Twitter presidency, and especially our President Donald Trump. Now, I'll tell you right now, I am not a big fan of long-winded speeches. This is not going to be a long-winded speech. I like, as uh, those of you who are my students know, a lot of back and forth. I like questions. I like answering questions. So, um, as before we get done, keep in mind whatever you want to ask me, and no question is out of bounds, as long as it's nice and clean. If you can say it in front of your brother, you can say it in front of me. Okay? Um, I would like to feel, I will feel as many questions as you would like. But once again, I'm not gonna stand here and wax eloquent for an hour and a half because I didn't like it as an undergrad and I'm not going to do it to you. Uh, but it is a newsworthy topic and thank you Jonathan for inviting me. And um, I'm a really big fan of this series and I'm happy to be here this morning. And I'm glad you could come. So, in any event, um, since he became president, Donald Trump has tweeted over 900 times, waxing eloquent in 280 characters or less about Crooked Hillary, Crazy Bernie, Pocahontas, and Little Rocket Man. He tweets so often that the White House maintains two separate Twitter accounts, one official and one for his private tweets, if there is such a thing. Thus, Donald Trump will be the first American president they have a section in the Presidential Archives of the Library of Congress dedicated solely to his tweets. There is no doubt that this is a presidency like no other in its transparency and immediacy. It is indeed the Twitter presidency, indicative of how social media is the new wave of mass media for the 21st century. No longer do CNN, NBC, and Fox rule the newsmaking roost, but now Instagram, Twitter, and for old folks like me, Facebook okay, um, have taken over. But although the president does maintain an official Twitter account for official White House public relations, what of the personal account? Is it wise to be privy to the president's thoughts off the cuff after a terror attack or a nuclear test by a foreign power? The first thing President Obama's transition team did in 2008 was strip him of his beloved Blackberry something unthinkable for this administration. But our opponents of the president's tweeting overreacted. Indeed, president number 45 has tweeted some things that have irritated both the opposition party, its own handlers, the Republican leadership on multiple occasions. It, um, following the Monica Lewinsky affair, President Clinton asserted that presidents have a right to a private life. It follows then that President Trump may make a claim that he has a right to a public one. It's not as if 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is a lead box. Rather, it is a glass house with what goes on inside influencing public opinion and perception. For example, baseball was always America's pastime since the age of the gold standard and railroads. But that all changed when President, Ken President Kennedy roughhoused with his family playing tackle football on the White House lawn. Now the Super Bowl is about as close to a national holiday as you can get and is the number one watched event on television year after year. Bill Clinton's public yearning for Big Macs during his presidency caused much angst and rending of garments in Burger King corporate boardrooms across the nation during the 1990s. Jelly bean sales skyrocketed in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan took office by making sure he had a bowl chock full of jelly bellies on the desk in the Oval Office. And we gleefully filled out our NCAA tournament basketball pools with Barack Obama, office or work policy be damned. The point is, is that we always have lived vicariously through the first family. And if we didn't know their thoughts, we made sure we turned their behavior into a trend. Indeed, 
tweeting is now undeniably more popular with the president in office. Three million people signed up for Twitter accounts following his inauguration. The president himself has more than 42 million followers. Perhaps this is the 21st century equivalent of that perfect spiral from RFK to JFK for a touchdown on the White House lawn back in 1961. But what are policy and public disclosure implications? Opponents of the Twitter presidency say this tips the hand of the U.S. in foreign policy and puts us at a disadvantage. Moreover, calling unstable, megalomaniacal foreign leaders names like Little Rocket Man may just set off a military confrontation due to the sheer psychological instability of the dear leader of North Korea. Others feel just the opposite and feel more informed, part of the political process, less alienated when they know that what's happening on a real-time basis. Another problem that arises out of the president's dual Twitter accounts is which one is to be believed as his real opinion. Is it the official polished tweet or the emotional shoot from the hip response of the social account? Such a dichotomy tends to give foreign governments fits and policy analysts of our allies a serious case of angst. Imagine JFK and his advisors hovering over two different teletypes each time from Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I may well not be standing here and this audience would consist of honeybees and cockroaches. A good deal of political science research, however, has concluded that the president serves as an outlet for our own emotional expressions, be they anger, sadness, or joy. The president conveyed quite well through his tweets the anger and the sadness we all felt after Las Vegas. We need this to feel empowered by our political process and feel a connection to our elected officials. Alas, this can also backfire when the president fails to read the public psyche correctly and sends the wrong message. The failure to outright condemn the neo-Nazis in Charlottesville and the initial standoffish response to the humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria immediately come to mind. This evoked anger and hurt in the minds of the public at a time when the president should have been a conduit for our grief instead of sowing dismay. The president is also the symbol of our social stability, the reassuring shoulder that we can lean on in times of distress. Anyone who's ever flown on a bumpy plane during a turbulent thunderstorm certainly does not want to hear the co-pilot praying the rosary over the intercom. It is in this area where the president has endured the most criticism for his use of Twitter. Used effectively as a weapon during the campaign cycle, remember Little Marco, Lion Ted, and low energy Jeb, his sparring with members of the news media and members of Congress convey an image of a lack of self control and an inability not to quote unquote take the bait. Retaliation is the golden rule, and he often comes off as swinging wildly, like a frustrated child at a birthday party who just can't hit the pinata hard enough. His advisors need to remind him that it is the job of the press to prod, poke, and agitate and that presidents must remain above the fray at times, even if the mudslinging is purposely malicious or outright unfair. Former First Lady Michelle Obama said it best, when they go low, you go high. Hence her husband's nickname, No Drama Obama. The Twitter presidency also comes with it its own unintended side effects. It appears to be extremely toxic to anyone working in public relations. During the President's first year in office, we have seen the departure of Press Secretary Sean Spicer, Press Aide Michael Short, Communications Director Michael Dubke, and Communications Director Anthony Scaramucci. Current White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders is working in a literal, verbal minefield. In answering questions from the press, she not only has to keep track of what the President might have tweeted in the last minute and a half, lest she look uninformed, but must spend 90% of her time explaining, interpreting, deciphering, or defending the president's most recent tweets. Not exactly what the job description has been over the last 50 years. Seldom has the prestige of a White House staff position fallen so precipitously. From the heady days of Pierre Salinger as mouthpiece of the Kennedy administration during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the position of press secretary has become little more than a paper cutout as Ms. Sanders' words have the weight of a cotton ball 
compared to the president's sometimes pointed and iron-fisted tweets. To make matters worse, her credibility has also suffered, as during press conferences she was convinced that John Kennedy and JFK were actually two different presidents, and then blasphemy referred to her boss as not President Trump, but as President Obama. The press corps mercilessly peppers her with questions about Trump's tweets, and there she dangles, a marionette with tangled strings who simply cannot keep up with her bosses, rapid fires, cell phone exchanges, and exclamations, and is in a no-win situation. Abraham Lincoln said at one point during the Civil War, if there's a worse place than hell, I'm in it. Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee has that t-shirt. <laughs> Finally, should the president be able to use Twitter to weigh in on social issues that have absolutely no, no, nothing to do with the presidency? Many people were taken aback when he weighed in rather strongly on the issue of some NFL players kneeling during the national anthem in the show of public protest. A lot of his supporters and many others were undoubtedly pleased. His position was clear. Get that SOB off the field right now. End of story. Or would have been for most presidents if they commented at all. But number 45 was not finished. Not by a long shot. During the next 30 days came 37 more tweets about the NFL, more than health care and the Las Vegas shooting combined. The NFL kneeling controversy was only outpaced by the Puerto Rican hurricane tragedy, which squeaked by with 39 tweets. Many people who voted for him are justifiably irritated by this because, one, Obamacare is still in effect, even though he promised to get rid of it practically the minute he got into office. Two, the factory jobs in the Rust Belt that were going to come back as a result of the great trade deals that supposedly were going to happen have never materialized. And three, there has been no appreciable work on the Great Wall of Mexico, and Mexico has yet to send us a single check to help pay for it, Yet here he is, all riled up about kneeling NFL players. Oh, those bothersome priorities and campaign promises. The winners so far in this administration have been on Wall Street, which has seen a fantastic surge in all the major indices so far, and those heavily invested multimillionaires kneeling maybe should kneel towards the Oval Office next time around because the next Lamborghini is coming courtesy of the White House. Ladies and gentlemen, we are truly in a new era and in uncharted waters. Your generation will be the first to truly define the use of social media as a main tool of communicating political news, ideas, and hopefully coming together to form groups that participate and have significant impacts on the political process. As for the current administration, maybe we just happen to have a particular president that thinks young and acts brashly. It's hard to imagine Mike Pence tweeting about Crooked Hillary, Ted Cruz tweeting about Little Rocket Men, or Bernie Sanders doing anything meaner than asking someone to go out for ice cream, which would probably be free. Perhaps the Twitter presidency is a one-shot deal, an anomaly, a political Haley's Comet, to be seen only once in a political lifetime. Perhaps it is not the medium itself, but the man himself. Oh, and by the way, you can follow my tweets at, at Dr. Brez. I'm trying really hard to get to 42 million followers, so please try and help me out. Thank you, and now I'll open the floor for questions. Yes, sir. Dr. Brzezinski, uh, by the way, that was very clever. I love that. Thank you. And my students do, too, I think. Has anybody been able to hack the president's tweets? As far as we know, no one has been able to infiltrate um, um, the president's tweets thus far and pretend he is the president and um, initiate something that really isn't him. World War III, yeah. Yeah, or, or, or exactly, yeah. Well, um, well, he hasn't insulted Rocket Man to the point where World War III is going to start this yet. Yeah. So um, all the things that he said, he's really said it hasn't been somebody else. And he does these things like at 4 in the morning? Um, he does them all around the clock whenever he feels like it, almost. Um, well, depend, uh, it, I guess you could say that, yeah. Yes. There has been an instance where his account was disabled. Okay, okay, disabled. 
Okay, I, okay. I was talking about um, somebody tweeting something that wasn't his. Okay. Um, disabled, yes. But as far as putting something out there like, I love Hillary Clinton and I should be in jail instead, okay, um, th that would never happen. Um, so everything he said so far has been genuine uh, on Twitter. Okay, that's coming from the hip or coming from the mouths of his advisors that are advising him to say that. What's the official account tweeting? Uh, the, uh, I don't know the I don't know the official count, but it's uh, it's going into it's, it's going to hit over a thousand uh, so, since his presidency really soon. So does anyone compare the differences between the official Twitter account and the POTUS account and the real Donald Trump account? I mean, are they uh, correlated or not? Uh, I I I haven't, I haven't compared them. I'm just doing the total tweets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what they're looking at, uh, what they're looking at, basically, is um, as far as the press, they look at the ones that are the most interesting and controversial. Okay, um, and the problem with this is, is when you go into the White House briefing room for a news conference with the press secretary, everybody's focused on what the president is going to say with his phone, rather than what the press secretary is going to say, which is a vast departure from past administrations, where the press secretary is supposed to be the mouthpiece for the administration. And that has totally been thrown out the window, along with Sean Spicer. <laughs> Would you say the role of the press secretary has permanently changed because of the position uh, we find ourselves in today? Um, it has permanently changed in this administration. Um, the press secretary position in this administration um, has been permanently, I would call it, um, reduced to that of, I guess, um, Kind of like the queen, stand there and wave, but with no real power. Okay, um, the next president, for example, um, may have a different personality. All right, um, for example, the vice president is absolutely nothing like the president, um, and would probably use traditional means to communicate with the media. Um, but as I said in my closing paragraph, um, is it the medium or the man? Uh, because we we have seen. Um, new ways of um, doing things before with new technology. For example, Barack Obama um, was a pioneer in generating money online for campaign purposes. And now everybody does it, and it's a matter of course. The question is whether the next person who becomes president um, uses Twitter to communicate like Donald Trump does, or uses traditional means to communicate with the press and with the people. Yes. Does he get a response from other international leaders? Mm -hmm. Does he get response from other international leaders? Um, if if he if he if he does and he talks about it, we'll know about it. If not, it's a matter of national security, and he doesn't have to talk about it at all. Okay. Um, but if he talks about like, hey, um, Putin and I just shared the nuclear codes. Okay. Um, you're probably not going to hear about it. Okay. But. Um, Usually when he makes comments, he makes comments about um, social issues. He makes comments about tragedies like Las, like Las Vegas. He makes comments about, for example, he went golfing with uh, the Prime Minister of Japan. Okay. Um, oftentimes, um, he, he, he will tweet about, you know, um, for example, he is fixated with Hillary. He is still fixated on Hillary Clinton, calling her crooked Hillary. Okay, and we'll, we'll tweet about her when I guess he has nothing to tweet about. Yes? Um, yes. Um, well, the president is supposed to be, um, I guess, above the fray, and the media is supposed to function as a watchdog on the presidency. Um, this goes back to Watergate and Nixon where he was the ultimate, you know, watchdog catching the person, you know, who was, who was doing wrong. Um, the relationship between the press and the president um, changed radically after Nixon. And um, Trump expects to be treated differently than previous presidents by the press, um, I guess because he's Donald Trump. Um, but um, in, in terms of him 
saying that the media should be silent and the criticism towards him is, uh, com is, is completely, as I see it, um, ridiculous. You know, because it's the media's job uh, to go after the president, to ask the tough questions. Um, if you've ever taken um, uh, a class with, you know, uh, Dr. Taroli here, um, who's been, who's know, who knows more about journalism, you know, um, was forgotten more about journalism than I, than I know, okay? They're supposed to ask the, ask the tough questions, okay? They're supposed to, you know, make the president uncomfortable. There isn't that cordial, cozy relationship that existed, you know, back when um, Kennedy was president. That kind of started to erode with Lyndon Baines Johnson and the Vietnam War, when maybe we're, we really weren't getting the truth out of the White House about how the Vietnam War was going. And then it really went downhill, okay, with Watergate and Nixon. And since then, the relationship between the press and the president um, has been one of, we're watching you, and we want to know your every move. That's not to say there have not been cordial relationships with, with the press and the president. Um, Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton both had excellent relationships with the press. Uh, they both loved him. And, it's no, and, it's, and, it, and it is, it is no um, coincidence that they're one of the most popular ex-presidents, you, know, you know, once they left office with the press corps. Yes. Uh, that was that was one of the that was one of the reasons that um, Obama's handlers in 2008 took his BlackBerry away from him is the fact that they didn't want um, anything that he put out there um, to be misinterpreted or manipulated, etc. Um, one of the biggest problems of having a quote unquote you know publicly accessible president on you know in out in um, the internet is the fact that you can take that stuff and you could make it look like however you want, and people, and, and you're, you're correcting your assumption that people who are ignorant of United States politics would think that, oh my God, he really did say this. He's gonna, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna deport everybody, you know, who isn't, you know, like um, uh, a white Anglo-Saxon <laughs> Protestant tomorrow, you know, or something like that. Yeah, and then that gets and sent and sent and sent. And yeah, it's, a, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, a bad meme on Facebook. Mm -hmm you know, that gets perpetuated, okay? Um, and the only problem with it is when the president says it, you know, it carries a lot more weight than when somebody who lives in his mother's basement and hasn't had a date in 15 years says it. Yes. Um, I have a question. Unlike the tweets and thoughts, the Mueller investigation, could they be used as a kind of evidence of some anything, sort? Anything is fair game. Anything is fair game in an investigation. Um, the president, just like um, in the case of Nixon, okay, um, when, they, when, they, when he was ordered to hand over his tapes, okay, um, he can keep his tapes as long as he resigns his position and keeps him as a private citizen. Okay, but um, all of, uh, of his communications, just like Hillary's emails, okay, um, are, are a matter of part of the investigation. So um, if anything, anything that Donald Trump sends, does, um, as president, um, can be part of any investigation. Okay, unless he's a private citizen, then he can claim it as his own private communication and not have it part of it. But I don't think he's going to resign, so that's uh, um, that's not going to happen. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Do 
have other presidents are so not accessible. Like they feel like more connected to him, like they can reach him better, and he's more out there. Is that why he is president? Um, I think why he is president is um, different from um, what he does as president. Okay, why he is president is uh, is because he tapped into something that nobody could predict. Okay, um, he managed to tap into um, an unforeseen force in the United States that every political pundit, including me, as I'm a, I'm an analyst for um, 610 Radio in Miami. And I totally blew off Trump as a presidential contender long ago, like uh, in August of the, of the primary season, as just you know another joker, you know who's just going to get on stage and get blown away by the likes of Jeb Bush or Ted Cruz or somebody like that, you know who's a, you know who's a real seasoned politician. Um, he was able to tap into a grassroots populist movement um, that was angry at the fact that. Um, Factories were closing, they were losing their jobs, okay? um, and they weren't getting in on what they call, what, what we call, quote unquote, the American dream. They, weren't, they were losing their shot at the middle class, you know, um, house in the suburbs, two cars, you know, two and a half kids, one boy, one girl, salt and pepper shakers, okay? You know, everybody, everybody has those, I have five kids, I'm nuts, okay? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't advise it. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, that's why he became president, is because he was able to tap into this dissatisfaction with the status quo of uh, I'm tired of you know I'm 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 tired of you know um, factories closing, and he made all these promises about making America great again, about about this is going to happen and that's going to happen and that's going to happen and that's going to happen. Okay, um, and this campaign. Um, he hardly spent any money. What did he do? He held these huge rallies. Okay, so in a sense, he was public, publicly accessible, but um, he did it through, okay, um, I guess you call it, you know, um, personal popularity. Okay, he didn't run many TV, didn't run many TV commercials. He held big rallies, but um, he wasn't politics as usual. He was the ultimate outsider. And everybody else was a Washington quote-unquote insider. And the people thought that somebody from the outside could do better than somebody who has been on the inside. And that's why he became president. Okay? Um, and, I, and, and I was wrong, and everybody, and I don't care who they are, you know, there's a political science out, a political science out there that says, oh yes, I've been doing this all along. Okay, their PhD means piled higher and deeper. Okay, uh, because nobody could have predicted this. On election night, I was as shocked as anybody else, um, because I had Hillary Clinton winning by five, possibly ten points. Okay, um, I mean, uh, and in, in popular vote, and um, definitely sweeping those northern states that she lost in the electoral vote. Okay, um, but Trump, as far as his accessibility to the people, all right. Um, his accessibility consists of, you know, you know, tweets, okay, tweeting, and I guess maybe now the people enjoy, you know, having a president that, oh, I, I tweet just like the president does, okay, maybe that, maybe that's a good, maybe that's a good thing, but remember, you're talking about a president whose approval ratings are uh, one of the lowest in history at this point in his presidency, okay, um, and. A lot of people, um, are, there are whispers of people challenging him for the nomination when it comes around again, okay, uh, for the next presidential election. Uh, so um, all the people that I mentioned, you know, that he made these promises to, um, I don't see any wall. Anybody see any wall up there? Okay, um, and so far I haven't seen any check from Mexico. Okay, and there are no pesos coming up here. Okay. Um, and let's see, um, there really hasn't been any, um, any, any great deals anybody's heard of that's really benefited the country and factories going up and jobs not going overseas and um, um, a great revival. The only thing that's happened is that Wall Street, Wall Street has skyrocketed. Um, the stock market has gone absolutely bananas. Um, so um, as, I mentioned in, as I mentioned in my remarks, um, all those wealthy NFL players that are kneeling 
um, they're making a ton of money. Okay, I mean, I can't I can't complain about the president. Uh, my 401k is doing well. Okay, your parents' 401k is probably doing very well. But the person who voted for him or worked in that factory, that that factory is still closed. Okay, that didn't open up. So uh, a lot of his campaign promises that he that he said he's going to make America great again on have not materialized. It has not happened. Um, the economy has gotten better, but it's gotten better for a certain sector, and that certain sector wasn't the sector that um, propelled him to victory. Yes. Ooh, that would be scary. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the, that's one of the problems of having a president that has no filter. Okay. Um, when he accesses his private account and goes on there and says Rocket Man's going to pay for this, you know, because he tested another missile, and all of a sudden, you know, the U.S. Pacific Fleet, you know, is is in the Sea of Japan. It's a problem. Okay. Um, that's what uh, in, during the debates. Okay, if you watch them, and I analyze them for WIOD when I went on the radio, um, is uh, one of the things that, um, uh, that Hillary Clinton pointed out was Trump's, um, I guess you call it, um, his uh, impulsivity. Okay, and he didn't have the temperament to be president. And that Hillary herself was a seasoned diplomat, you know, who knew how to handle things you know, in a crisis, where Trump would fly off the handle. Notice that when he's criticized, his immediate Reaction is to what? Retaliate. Okay, um, he punches back immediately. Okay, um, okay and sometimes in, when you're talking about um, a leader of a, a nation with the most technologically superior armed forces in the world um, against a nation, all right, that is a nuclear power, okay, with um, a leader that I would say is not all that, you know, um, all his cats aren't in the bag, I can tell you that, okay? Um, antagonizing that person is not a very good idea, okay? Um, and his impulsivity, will it get us into trouble at some point? Um, I can't predict that. Right now, he has a new chief of staff that's trying to rein him in, okay, in terms of, in terms of, national, in terms of national security. So you, you can't say this, you can't say that, okay? And, um, but, I mean, will he say something that's going to, you know, cause North Korea to launch a miss missile at South Korea? You know, uh, you know who is to say? Um, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, that as his presidency goes on, that he listens to his advisors more, okay, and um, that little kid inside of him that's dying to retaliate less. Because, um, to be fair, um, I believe that um, the the uh, dear leader of North Korea did call him a barking dog, okay? Um, which, um, of course, uh, the president did not like at all. Yes, ma'am. A lot of people usually have the mentality that, you know, if the president says this or does this, then that means I can do it too. Do you think that because of the way he is, like not having a filter, that it's why crime rates, bullying, Okay. Um, uh, a lot of things can be attributed to the president's behavior. Um, there are a lot. There are theories, um, especially that um, when the president does something, okay, it's okay for the rest of us to do it. I'll give you a classic example uh, from my generation. Every generation has this defining moment. For um, a lot of people in this room, it was 9/11 when the buildings came down. Okay, on that day, people remember where they were, what they were doing. Uh, for my parents' generation, it was like. They all knew where they were when, when JFK got shot. For my grandparents, it was uh, for when, um, when Pearl Harbor got bombed, okay? Um, but when you talk about um, if it's okay to do something, I remember from my generation um, when the Challenger blew up, the space shuttle, okay? Um, I remember where I was, what I was doing. I'm not gonna tell you because you'll know how old I am, okay? Um, but I can tell you when we went out, when I, when I saw the president come on TV that night, Ronald Reagan, and he uttered the words, they reached up and touched the face of God, 
Okay, um, I was sitting there um, with a bunch of my friends and there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And if it was okay for the president to get choked up, it was okay for the rest of us to get choked up. Okay, so um, just like uh, after 9-11 when George Bush was standing at ground zero with the bullhorn, okay, with the firemen, you know, and there was a tear coming out of the corner of his eye, it was okay then for America to cry, to let it all out, okay? Um, but as far as um, the bullying parts, okay, um, I think um, that you can't blame a single individual um, for a phenomenon. I think it's a societal phenomenon um, uh, in terms of bullying. Um, back, back, back in the day, you know, it was just called getting beat up after school, okay? <laughs> Um, and uh, I know because I got beat up after school a lot, okay? Um, so until I got older. Um, but when the president does when the president does something, okay, or says something, and we uh, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Um, well, in certain situations, the president does have to serve as a role model, okay? Um, and certain things that he does, okay, are going to be emulated by certain people in society and think it's okay. For example, by not coming out and saying that um, the people in Charlottesville waving the Nazi flag were flat out wrong was a mistake on his part. Because um, uh, my dad was a Korean War vet, okay? And every veteran in America who went ashore on D-Day and gave his life to tear down that Nazi flag Okay, um, was not happy to see that Nazi flag waving on American soil that day in Charlottesville. And he should have been the first as president to call out those people and say that what they were doing was wrong. So in a sense, okay, his lack of not doing that was saying that, oh, both sides are just as bad as the other. Okay, um, it wasn't a strong enough condemnation. And that sent a message to the rest of the country saying that, oh, well, um, they're just Nazis. And, um, you know, um, and I guess they have, the right to, they have the right to say what they want, which they do under the First Amendment. Okay? But he did not say what they represent is wrong. And that is the fundamental problem with um, behavior of a major public figure, like the president. When, not when he does something, but when he fail, when he when he sees something wrong and fails to point out how wrong it is, and I think that's probably the biggest mistake um, so far that he has made in his presidency, making fun of Little Rocket Man, calling Hillary crooked, and calling Bernie crazy. Um, you know, people can live with all that, but when you're talking about people waving Nazi flags, and you don't come out and condemn it immediately, um, that's a problem. Okay, as president, you've got to be all over that uh, because that is a, a fundamental American value that you need to defend. Yes? Do you believe that President Trump using Twitter as a platform to scrutinize the media? Uh, that's actually a good point. What he's using it for is what he calls to control the media cycle. When something bad happens, um, the president is excellent at Getting everybody to go, look, okay? Get everybody to look the other way. Change, change everybody's direction, okay? Um, even if it's something outrageous that he gets criticized for, at least somebody's looking the other way. Uh, uh, the FBI director got fired today. Look, that's what I just said, okay? Um, he, is, he did it during the, he, 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 he controlled the news cycle during the campaign uh, for the nomination. He managed to control the news cycle to some extent um, uh, during the campaign for president. When he was doing poorly in the polls, notice that he had no control over the campaign cycle and he wasn't the center of attention. When he controls what, what stories okay, um, are in the news and, he, and they're about him and he put them there, he does well. Um, so um, as far as manipulating the media, um, yeah, he's trying to do that. He's actively trying to do that. And uh, on his part, it's a, it's a smart move, but it's not helping 
right now his approval ratings, which are you know way way down, simply because um, people perceive him as not doing his job. Yes. Do you also believe that his conflict with media coverage has caused the so-called era of fact-checking or misinformation? Okay. Uh, I think that, that, that this whole phenomenon of fake news is the fundamental problem. Okay. Um, that there were so many lies during the campaign. I mean, not just not not just you know stretching the truth, but outright lies. Okay. Um, that now. Uh, it's like when the, every time a politician opens their mouth, whether the president or city council person, everybody is running to Google, okay, you know, to fact check it immediately, okay. Or uh, people who are their supporters, um, this is the main problem, supporters don't check it and take it as gospel, okay. Um, Mark Twain had a great quote, okay. Um, it's not what we don't know, um, that gets us in trouble is what we do know, okay, and don't believe that just ain't so. That gets us in trouble, okay. So it's the people that don't fact check, okay, and you know see what's for real, is what gets us in trouble. Um, the people that do actually fact check, okay, um, and you know look at what the president says, and you know and. Uh, they're the people, you know, who are probably the most informed voters. <laughs> the good thing about it is now people are more informed, especially your generation. Your generation is possibly the most um, informed, connected than any other in history. Uh, my generation, we're worried about um, uh, how well can we play Donkey Kong, okay? Um, you guys, okay, um, were a major force and um, Bernie Sanders campaign, and you were a, ma you were a major force um, in Hillary Clinton's campaign, a, um, you were a major factor in putting Barack Obama in the White House twice, okay? um, and your use of social media okay, um, is going to be who determines who is going to occupy seats in Congress and the White House in the future. Okay, because um, the more you guys, the more you guys vote. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, I'm, I'm. I'm living older. I have to. I have five children because I'm not allowed to die. Okay, until they finish college, and I'll be 89 by then. Okay, um, but you guys um, have access to the most information ever. Okay, ever. You don't have to believe what's on CNN. Okay, you don't have to believe what's on Fox. You don't have to believe what's on CNBC or MSNBC. You can go and check it out for yourself, okay? Um, and now we have uh, almost instant um, on the spot, we have people on the spot all the time, okay? On YouTube, you know, people, you know, at the scene of political rallies, okay? To find out what really happened, okay? For example, when there were fights at Trump's rallies, who really started them? Were they instigated by Trump himself? Were they instigated by a Trump supporter? You got people there with cameras filming it, you can see for yourself who did it. Okay, you don't have to believe the political spin doctors anymore. Okay, so um, the power of media technology, okay, um, lays in your hands. Okay, um, I'm just worried. I'm, I'm worried about my cracked phone. All right, you guys, okay, um, have all everything at your disposal. You know, um, for the future. Should we be worried about foreign influence in social media? I know both. I know Google, Facebook, and uh, Twitter were. Uh, I, I know they testified in Congress recently about the millions of people of users affected by foreign or Russian influence social media misinformation. Is is there a dark side to social media? Yes, there's a dark. There's a dark side to any open media. Um, that's one of the that's one of the bad things about um, I guess having um, the freedom uh, that we have uh, in terms of the First Amendment. Okay, um, it permits things like um, hate, you know, like uh, speech, like occurred at Charlottesville and recently at the University of Florida. Okay, um, and it also permits it gives people the right to lie. Okay, um, it gives corporations the right to lie. It gives 
people from foreign countries the right to lie. It gives you the right to lie. It gives anybody the right to lie, as long as it doesn't cross the line and become, okay, uh, slander. Okay, so you can feed misinformation after misinformation after misinformation. I can't tell you how many times after you know after 9/11. You know, I saw pictures of people standing on the building with a jet in the background, okay, saying this picture was just taken right, you know, right before 9/11. This is one of the victims, okay, um, you know, because it was photoshopped, all right. Um, and so, lying on social media is nothing new, and it's going to continue. It's and it's going to continue now is through you know mostly memes. Why memes? Uh, because memes are easy. They're bumper sticker, they stick in the brain, okay, they're like that song you can't get out of your head, okay, the earworm, all right, that, you know, that, uh, that, that stays there no matter what you do, okay, um, and, there, and that is going to be a fact, unless you have a closed society like North Korea, okay, that strictly monitors what content goes on the web and what doesn't, okay, and I don't think as um, someone who has, uh, as a constitutional scholar, that's not a place where we want to go. It's up to the individual um, to look at what's out there, you know, what you know, what's what's garbage and what's not. I mean, um, you may get you may, you may get defended by somebody on Facebook, okay, by calling them out, you know. But um, you know, I mean, that actually happened to me once, you know, by some you know by by some, somebody put up a meme, you know, uh, by by something about you know the connection between you know. Um, I think it was uh, uh, Saddam Hussein and you know 9/11. Um, of course, there was none. I pointed that out, and they got mad. Okay, you know, um, so uh, that's up to you to filter out what's true and what's not true. Yeah, it's up to everybody because now there's more. There's, uh, the, the more the information highway is widened, the more crazy drivers you're going to have on it. What was before? Okay, you mean, mean going, um, right. all right, just going back to, um, for example, the, the, the classic presidency of a president who has a press secretary that goes up there and, um, well, um, there are people there that yearn for the good old days. Okay, um, um, for some of the teachers of the presidency, it's a pain for me because I have to rewrite all my lecture notes. <laughs> okay, because this man has changed the presidency pretty much um, radically and for all time possibly. He certainly changed the campaign process. Okay, um, how do you win without spending money? He did it. How do you win without? How do you win without you know saturating the uh, the airway with commercials? He did it. Okay, um, he did everything unconventionally. Okay, how did he do it by insulting virtually every single group I can see in this room? at one time or another, okay, and still managed to win the election. I mean, name one group that he did not manage to offend or insult during his campaign through either um, some kind of uncovered film or a comment or fight with a journalist or whatever, and he still won, okay? Now that he's president, okay, um, the main weapon that got him elected, okay, was his phone. He used his phone effectively. Making tweets about little Marco, making tweets about lying Ted, making tweets about crooked Hillary, crazy Bernie. Okay, he used it as a weapon. Okay, and it's like it's like my son, who is eight and has his Winnie the Pooh. You ain't taking Pooh Bear away from him unless you unless you want to fight. Okay, that's like his phone, his Twitter account. Okay, um, it saw him through a grueling primary process. It saw him through an election that nobody thought he could win. And now that he's president, um, do you think that even the, the most common sense, okay, I mean, right now, I think he's got somebody, um, you know, he's got, he's, got, he's got some people surrounding him that are level-headed and politically savvy, but I don't think he's going to listen because he loves his phone too much and he loves being the center of attention too much 
and he is just the type of person that wants to control what people are thinking. Even if it's negative, you're thinking about him. And to answer your question in that roundabout way, do I wish we were back in the old days? Um, yes and no. Yes, because, um, well, uh, it's certainly easier to quantify it for research purposes, okay? Um, but the Chinese have a saying, okay, may you live in interesting times. And they don't get any more interesting than this. <laughs> Um, as far as national security goes, okay, um, I don't, I don't, I don't think that is a, you know, uh, uh, well, first of all, slander is a pretty harsh word, okay. Um, when, you, when you're talking, um, you know, he bashes Hillary on a regular basis, you know, um, just because, you know, I, I don't know why he won, you know, he should leave her alone, you know, he can even put her in jail like he promised, you know, another broken campaign promise, okay, but. Um, uh, I don't. I don't think it's a breach of national security. Okay, um, a, a breach of national a breach of national security would be tweeting about what he talked about in a meeting. You know, just had a great meeting with the Japanese prime minister. Boy, well, guess what we're going to do to North Korea? You know, okay, that would be that would be something. You know, like uh, we're you know, guess what we're going to put in our military bases in Japan next? Okay, or the bombers are in the air. Send. <laughs> Okay, um, that would be the kind. That would be the kind of thing, you know, that would uh, people are afraid of. Um, I think someone out there mentioned impulsivity. Okay, you know, like if there's a terrorist attack and he wakes up at three o'clock in the morning and someone tells him that and he tweets that, um, all right, okay, the bombers are in the air. I mean, uh, that, that's that, that's that's going to that's going to scare the bejesus out of a lot of people who are going to be awake. I'm not awake with that. All right. Um, but I'm going to be awake and see that, okay, um, when we don't have all the facts, okay, especially, you know, um, like, for example, the recent terror attack. Yes? I was going to ask about that. Is it wrong for him to tweet about, like, giving him the death penalty or, like, putting him in jail? Okay. Um, well, as a, that's difficult to say because when he, if he, He's, when he's, he's tweeting as a, as a private citizen, he has, the, he has the right to say anything he wants. Okay, but he's president of the United States. And in a sense, you know, I'd love to give him the death penalty. He, he tweeted during the campaign about punching people in the face and committing assault. Okay. Um, and, you know, uh, which, which, is, which, is, which is also, you know, um, beyond the pale. All right. And, uh, and his followers loved him for it. Okay. Um, his base, so to speak, okay, um, is this is the kind of tough talk on terror, on immigration, etc., okay, um, that that got him elected, okay, that um, that resonated with the people, um, I guess the, the 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 silent the silent unsatisfied American, okay, that went to the polls, you know, um, that flew under the radar. When everyone said Clinton was ahead in all these key states, and she, and she turned out not to be, okay. Um, but is it wrong for him to say that, okay? Um, but he, but, but he, in in a sense, it's not acting presidential, okay. Um, acting presidential would be um, we're going to prosecute this individual to the fullest extent of the law, and something like that. That's the presidential way to do it, okay. A lot of people thought when he got into office, he would start acting presidential and not act like Donald Trump, okay? Um, that didn't happen, okay? He's continuing to act just like the campaign Donald Trump. And um, the office hasn't changed the man. The man has changed the office, okay? Because people tend to act differently, you know, when, uh, when they get into the Oval Office, okay? Um, um, a lot of people, I mean, presidents have done outlandish things in the past, okay? He's not the only one. Um, Theodore Roosevelt used to hold bare-knuckle boxing matches, 
in the White House, okay, to solve a labor dispute once, okay, he took the head of a company and the head of a union and shoved them in a room and locked the door from the outside and wouldn't let them out or give them food and water until they solved their differences, okay. Um, so as far as presidential behavior goes in terms of um, what he's doing and what he's saying, it's, it's kind of in the same vein as, you know, um, uh, I'd fire every one of those NFL players and get that SOB off the field, you know, um, for kneeling uh, during the national anthem. It's, it's about the same thing as, you know, uh, I'm going to give this guy the death penalty and send him to Guantanamo. Guess what? Um, as president, he doesn't have the power to give him the death penalty because we have separation of powers, okay? Um, and he can't, can't pick him up and send him to Guantanamo, you know, and lock him up for the rest of his life because um, he doesn't have that authority, okay? Um, can't lock him up without trial.